Hello there, I'm Michael Barber, an Associate Professor of Instructional Design at Toro University of California. I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about the K-12 school system and the coming 2020-21 school year and what that might look like. But first, I'd like to thank Toro University for providing me with the opportunity to deliver this presentation to the Solano County Virtual Fair. So the big question that everybody has as we think about our K-12 education system is what will school look like in the fall? One of the advantages that we have here in the United States is the fact that there are many countries around the world that have year-round school systems or calendars that are different than what ours is. So we've been able to look and see what has happened in those jurisdictions. We've seen examples of students physically distancing as they line up to go into school. We've seen examples of students having their temperature checked prior to entering the building or classroom. We've seen teachers that have rearranged their classrooms so that desks are spaced further apart and that portions of tables aren't used. We've seen students remain in the classroom for the entire day as opposed to moving about the building from class to class or for things like lunch and recess. We've seen students wearing masks. We've seen barriers that have been placed on desks to prevent students from being able to interact with each other. Even during school assemblies and other larger gatherings, we've seen students continue to use masks and physical distancing continued. Even in schools where students attend a cafeteria for lunch, we've seen the physical and social distancing maintained. And in these examples, hopefully you've noticed the variety of countries that have been referenced in the bylines. And as we look around the world, one of the instructive examples that we can pull from is actually from France. In the case of France, they brought their schools back mostly at the primary level and mostly in rural areas so that large urban centers like Paris were not included in the return to school. And as you can see from this picture, students are socially distanced and they're wearing masks. As you can see from this picture, one of the things that has been a focus has been on ensuring that students are washing their hands regularly. All classrooms include hand sanitizer and other forms of personal protective equipment. Students are socially distanced at all times. Schools have even taken to physical measures to ensure that students maintain that physical distance that is so important. Schools have even taken physical measures to ensure that social distancing is maintained even in areas that aren't normally directly supervised. However, even with all of these measures in place, there is still cause for concern. As we've seen in France, one of the things that happened quite quickly after schools opened up is that the spread of the virus increased quite significantly, as well as the need to close down a number of schools within weeks of reopening. And what is most troubling about this course of events is because children have not been impacted that much by the virus to date, there is still a great deal about how it actually affects young people that we don't know. So I believe the reality of the situation is that schooling won't be truly safe until a vaccine is in place and a significant portion of the population has been vaccinated. The current accelerated timeline indicates that it is likely that we will have a vaccine candidate in place late in 2020 or early in 2021. However, it is important to remember that once a vaccine has been found to be effective, that it still has to be manufactured at a large scale and then we have to go through the process of actually vaccinating people. What this means is that the herd immunity that is needed to be able to deal with this virus likely won't be achieved before the end of the 2021 school year. 
keeping these things in mind, the Department of Education here in the state of California has recently released a guidebook for the safe reopening of California's public schools. In that guidebook, they recognize the fact that there will need to be some legislative changes and some regulatory changes to allow for some of the models that have been proposed. The other thing that they fully acknowledge throughout the document is the fact that there is no one solution to this problem. And the guidebook itself presents leaders with a series of questions that they need to consider as they look at their own local context. The guidebook does provide four examples of potential models that could exist. The first example they provide is the two-day rotation model where some students would attend school on Mondays and Wednesdays and other students would attend school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. During those days where students aren't physically attending the school, they would be responsible for learning in a remote or online setting based upon things that the teacher had prepared for them in advance. The second example provided in the guidebook is similar to the first, except in this example, instead of having the students attend on alternating days, students attend on alternating weeks. So you might have half of the students in grade four attending during the first week, and then in the second week, those students would be learning online or remotely, while a second group of students would be at physically attending the school. As with the first example, this model would require a significant amount of online or remote instruction. The third example they provide is an example for elementary and middle school students where students would have a multi-graded classroom and teachers would work together in cohorts. So you would have multiple teachers that would teach the same group of students, not just this year, but it may be the same teacher that they had last year and likely would be the same teacher that they would have the following year. This specific example does not include the use of remote or online learning. Similarly, the fourth example provided by the guidebook also doesn't require the use of online or remote learning. In this particular model, the student schedules are staggered so that the students are attending schools at different times, which would allow for a fewer number of students to be in the building at any given time. This particular model also encourages students to remain in their classrooms, not just for schooling activities, but for things like lunch and recess. Additionally, having the students in the room and having the teachers rotate decreases the number of individuals that would be in the hallway at any given time during those transition periods. From a structural perspective, the first two examples are the ones that would be the easiest to implement, which means they are the ones that are most likely to be used by your child's school during the coming school year. As both of those models rely quite heavily upon online and remote learning, it is useful to consider some advice for parents to help their children in this unique learning space. The first is that you want to set up a space that is conducive to learning. In much the same way that when a child is walking to or being bused to school, they are going to a physical space that is designed for learning, you want to try to create that in your home. This allows the child to know that when they are in this particular space or at this particular space, if it's just a portion of a room, that it is time to be working on their schoolwork and not time to be doing other things. It provides a psychological incentive for them to be working simply because they are located now where they do their schoolwork. In much the same way that parents should try to create a physical space for their students to learn during the school day, 
It's also important to understand what the school day may mean for you and your family. Just because the traditional school day begins at 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning and continues until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that doesn't mean that you have to set up your school day during the remote or online instruction in that fashion. In some cases, teachers may have specific scheduled events that your student has to attend. Maybe it's a synchronous class that's being taught through Microsoft Teams or Google Hangouts or Zoom. However, it's likely that much of the activity that your child will be doing during their remote learning will be entirely upon your schedule. This provides you with the opportunity to create a routine that is conducive to how your household actually flows on any given day. In addition to having a physical space to go to school while they are remote learning and a specific routine that you've developed that works with how your household flows, you also want to make sure that children are prepared for learning. There's a reason why schools have play spaces outside of them that children can engage in prior to the morning lessons or during recess or during portions of lunch. Part of that is to burn off some of the energy that they have that would oftentimes prevent them from being ready to learn. As you consider the routines that you develop, you want to make sure that the types of things that prevent your child from learning, you want to accommodate activities that will ensure that your child is prepared for learning. And having a conversation with your child and as well monitoring them when the school year begins to see if there are particular times of the day or particular activities that they engage in that aren't conducive to getting them ready to learn. The final piece of advice I would give is that no one expects you to be your child's teacher during these remote learning lessons. Parents are definitely partners with the school in their child's education, but even in a remote setting, there is still a teacher that is responsible for facilitating the learning of your child. You want to make sure that you establish a good relationship and communicate on a regular basis with your child's teacher, and that relationship will allow you to have the comfort to be able to reach out to your child's teacher when you realize that your child isn't progressing the way that they should or that you're having difficulty finding time for your child to engage in their remote and online learning. During these unusual times when students are learning both at school and at home, it is important for you to advocate for your child and having a relationship with the teacher, but also knowing that no one expects you to be the primary instructor of your child is important. In closing, it is important to remember that the coming school year will be very different than any school year that we've experienced prior to this point in time. At the end of the day, you, your child's teacher, your child's school, all have the best interests of your child at heart and are trying to make decisions that will ensure that your child receives a quality education during the 2020-21 school year. Having said that, there's likely going to be some bumps in the road as things get started. So it is important for all of us to have some patience and empathy for those that are trying their best to navigate what is an unusual situation. So I hope that you found some of these examples from other countries instructive, that the guide that the state of California has made available is something that you can gain access to and engage with your child's school as they begin their planning for next school year, and that you found some of the tips that I provided useful in thinking about how you may help your child during what is a stressful and unusual time for them as well. If you have any comments or questions about anything that I've talked about during this video, I'd welcome you contacting me at the email address or website listed on the screen. 
Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today.